Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to welcome you for this exhibition's exhibition talk between Rebecca Quaitman, the artist, and Joseph Kerner, author, art historian, professor of history and architecture at Harvard. I'll begin with Joseph, just a few biographical cornerstones so that you can situate them. Joseph was born 1958 in Pittsburgh as a son of the Viennese painter Henry Kerner. He was partially raised in Vienna in the summer months, I would say, vacation time. To situate him uh, in his writing, I'm just going to name his most important books. The first one, which I think was also important for Rebecca, was Caspar David Friedrich and the sub subject of landscape in 1990, the moment of, so moment of self-portraiture in German Renaissance, 1993, the reformation of the image in 2004, and most recently in the context of his Mellon lectures, published at Princeton University Press, Bosch and Bruegel, from enemy painting to everyday life, a uh, book I very much recommend. I just read it recently. The list of academic distinctions and award is really very impressive. And I will just mention one recent one, which is the Mellon Award in 2009. This award, which is generously endowed, enabled him to write and direct and produce a new film titled The Burning Child, a film about the Viennese interior from Otto Wagner to present day. Joseph gave a lecture to, on this subject in 2013 here in this room. Rebecca Quaitman was born in 1961 in Boston. She lives and work in, works in New York and Connecticut. Rebecca structures her oeuvre in chapters, working site-specifically in terms of local contextualization as well as installation. This exhibition is titled An Evening, Chapter 32. Rebecca's new body of work took at its point of departure two paintings by Otto van Veen, Rubens's teacher, which Rebecca discovered in the depository of the Kunsthistorische Museum. She initiated and financially supported the restoration of these important works. Her most recent show was solo exhibitions were held at the Muse Museum Abteiberg München Gladbach in 2012, Renaissance Society Chicago 2013, Tel Aviv Museum of Art in 2015, MoCA Los Angeles 2016, and Documenta 14 in Kassel and Athens in 2017. Her work is represented by the galleries Miguel Abreu, Daniel Buchholz, and Barbara Gladstone. Rebecca and Joseph, to have you two here at this table is like a fantasy. Uh, it wasn't my idea, it was Rebecca's idea. Uh, it's great, Joseph, that you're in the middle of a semester. I think you are the chair of the art history right now. Could make it over. Thank you very much for your generosity. Thank you, Sylvie. Uh, it's an honor for me to be able to have a conversation with uh, Rebecca, whose work I have followed, and um, I'd like to thank her for having this conversation with us here in this room. Um, and it's, her exhibition is a conversation with the space of the secession. Uh, and that's not particularly unique to this chapter of her chapters. All her work um, in these chapter exhibitions have been with a conversation with the space, the architecture, even the art that is in the site where the exhibition will take place. Um, so that her art becomes a way of interrogating a site. Yeah. Finding its DNA and in a way transforming it once you go, you've dug up stuff that maybe people didn't know about, and uh, it's transformed, and it transforms your uh, own work as you move forward. So I guess the first question I would have, the, sec the secession was 
designed as much for an exploration of a spatial art, yeah. Raumkunst, as it was called, as it was for as a venue for art. Mm -hmm. And you've said, uh, the, uh, described your own work as being a composition in space. And I wonder if we can just go back to the beginning when you saw this famously undivided uh, proto-white cube mm -hmm. where, where everything that's inside will be theatrical scenery in a way. Mm -hmm. yeah. And how did you, what was your first decision as you began to make your own space out of the tabula rasa yeah. of the secession? Well, I was very ha excited to be offered to do a, a chapter here because it's so rich, not only the secession, but the, the city and the, the, the context. Also with artists I've been involved with over my life, if there's such a strong history of conceptual art here. And uh, so, uh, and I also just really love the fact that it was a, it's the only institution I can think of in the world were basically run by artists. Mm -hmm. And uh, so th that in itself was really interesting to me. And then, but then in the case of my work, it is a problem because they're relatively small paintings. And in a sense, this is a difficult room for paintings uh, because well, for many reasons. So it was interesting to hear you talk about how the Beethoven frieze and, uh, was in reference to the site. And, yes. Um, but, but I realized that when I uh, started thinking I would use the dimensions or the length of the Beethoven mm -hmm. frieze to determine the number of panels mm -hmm. that I would use, uh, and then when I started getting using the dimensions of the architecture, many, many it, became, it opened up mm -hmm. in a way. If you can sort of slip into a logic of a building mm -hmm. in terms of measurement and geometry, it, it gives mm -hmm. in a sense. And the, the decision, I suppose, at that level, the decision to put the walls at an angle and to keep them uh, not touching how, how uh, the not touching take us through, yes take us through the through not touching and it went the diagonal many, placement many many kind of first I was going to just make a room or a uh, yeah a room like the Beethoven, like the Beethoven. freeze room and mm -hmm. put them around and I found that just that that formation of paintings was very deadening mm -hmm. somehow because it's all concentrated on the the small wall. And that's when I decided to, to make it an angle. And I've, I, I like the drama of the 45 degree angle as opposed to a, a right angle mm -hmm. in the wall. Mm -hmm. And I've done it twice before. In fact, chapter one at the Queen's mm -hmm. Museum was like that. Yes. Um, and so I wanted to also connect it to this other panoramic freeze I made for Mocha called Morning and uh, but not exactly the same. And so it seemed a logical thing mm -hmm. to go back to the 45 degree angle. Just f uh, picking up on the, maybe we'll get to the Oh, oh but oh, one sorry. thing, sorry, the, uh, I had many ideas about how to peer at that painting because the big problem was how to include the Van Veen. Uh -huh. And so I kept thinking that I, of ideas about how to put it outside the space but visible, mm -hmm. and it had to do with maybe cutting holes between the paintings and the wall. I did many different variations, and finally at the end, I realized it's much more simple to just have the two walls and not have them not meet. Mm -hmm. It just seemed It's interesting, I, until you said it, I ha hadn't uh, appreciated the degree to which, if, if this is a kind of diagonal or oblique secession in relationship, to right. the rest, yeah. uh, the old master stands apart from it, which is in a way how the secession was originally formed as a kind of dialogue with the academy, with the Kunsthistorisches yeah. Museum. So there is a funny relationship to yeah. begin with. Um, 
so in the, if we, before we get to the Beethoven frieze and how it's evoked by the proportion, the original idea of many of these secession shows was to create a um, interior, mm -hmm. in a way like an interior for a dwelling space, but it was something a little bit more lofty, some kind of interior. Um, your paintings also shape interiors, but they play games with, uh, the, with whether they are or not are part of part it. Of it. So or, or let me, what detachable. do you understand about, uh, how do you understand the interior spaces that your uh, installations produce? Uh, well, I think that maybe I'm influenced by minimalist sculpture somewhat mm -hmm. and sort of the, the, a large gesture. Mm -hmm. And uh, it seems like you could make large gestures with walls instead of paintings. Yes. So it's good to, in a way, uh, make the first gesture. And, 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 and then when you understand the plan the, of the architecture of the space, you can begin to think about how many paintings, what's on the paintings, and what they do in that space. Mm -hmm. So it's a way to take charge and also to fill to take charge of the space mm -hmm. instead of just it being open, detachable element, I yes. guess. And, and uh, the way the, the, your first gesture creates, I think we can all agree, some perspectival yeah. structure. Yes. Uh, some perspectival structure which doesn't <clears throat> end in a focal point but has a kind of gap. Right. Uh, Perspective is something that you both like and don't like. Could you? What, yeah, what, what, is your, I, what are I, your feelings I, about I've, perspective? I've always very much felt that perspective and one point perspective, the history of perspective, is really at the root of the way to think about how to make a painting because we're very much locked into its logic now more than ever. And I guess when I started painting, uh, it seemed to me that. Uh, that uh, even abstract paintings were behaving as if they, they had perspective in them and, or, or, or were approached and looked at the way, the way uh, a photograph would be looked at, as if, it's, it's, as if it has this kind of ego and identity that's in isolation. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess I was just often would apply ideas that other kind of media was using and thinking about and talking about, I would apply it to painting, and almost 99% of the time it was easy to do, mm -hmm. apply, apply an idea about video, apply an idea about a photograph, apply an idea about anything. Mm -hmm. You could always do it with mm -hmm. a painting. Mm -hmm. That was really kind of a magical realization. Mm -hmm. and, and in this case, the, it's across paintings, right? The perspective it, is not in the painting so much as it's across yeah. the painting. So to me, I guess I felt that I, I, the, the goal was to be an abstract painter in my, in my part, uh, but that seemed very, very impossible. Mm -hmm. uh, so I thought, think about abstraction and start pushing pictures back on a hinge, mm -hmm. in a sense. Mm -hmm. put, make them, um, yeah, the, what's the word when you put them on, I'm blanking on the word, but... Uh, when just pushing it on a hinge, so you show you show how the flatness of the image. Yes. And so I think that that also then comes into the architecture, mm -hmm. a way mm -hmm. that everything it's the f it's turning your body's turning the image is turn is oblique, mm -hmm. orthogonal. That's the word orthogonal. 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 Yes. So. Um, uh, yeah, that's why I first began thinking with Cobro, Katarzyna Cobro, where I r remade a sculpture of hers and photographed it because it was so obviously uh, not telling you the whole story. Mm -hmm. A photograph of a sculpture I thought was interesting because mm -hmm. it's so wrong and flat in a sense. It, the, uh, I was reminded uh, also again, uh, maybe more uh, specifically, of the legacy of of. Klimt's uh, Beethoven frieze, mm. which also probably amongst its many radical gestures was to transfer painting from 
a art that's on some kind of support that's set forward from the wall mm -hmm. and is on a transportable yeah. um, gr ground, uh -huh. as in uh, a stretched canvas, to a form of painting that's embedded in the wall and in fact is really almost a part of the wall. Uh, yeah. and, and then to give the wall at least as much value as the painting itself. Um, and I'm, uh, in your work, you have one of your telltale uh, signature motifs is the painting with the bevel. Mm -hmm. uh, t take us, for those who don't know, that particular <laughs> aspect of your work. Well, uh, I just, the sim the, just the simple basic method is I use 10 sizes uh, that are modular, so the squares fit into the rectangles, and the rectangles are a golden section. And I did that to enable me to make, put together very different kinds of images. Mm -hmm. um, and, but there to be the sense of a, a kind of logic in mm -hmm. the geometry. Um, and I, I always liked wood better than canvas because canvas could be, you could paint it any size and then afterwards you can stretch it. Mm -hmm. So you really never know. It's, it's not based on the edge, whereas with a wood panel, from the get-go, it has to be based on the dimensions of the edge of the panel. But then I also realized that uh, it looked like a box a little bit if I didn't bevel the edge. And then weirdly, there was this, I, I started copying Mondrian lozenge shape paintings on the wall, and I realized they were beveled. And then that worked, and then it worked as a motif to, to signify basically the painting and plan. Mm -hmm. And also it was painted. Mm -hmm. And I learned your father uh, was uh, not only an abstract painter, but an abstract painter who um, worked in shaped canvases, in canvases that, yeah. that where the, the painting was in a dialogue with the physical, almost sculptural aspect, or questioning the canvas as a given and yes. turning it into a sculptural element. Yeah. H how how um, did that legacy affect your your thinking in this regard? Well, I mean, biographically, I think uh, his best friend at the time was my, my half-brother Mark's father, David von Schlegel, was a sculptor, who I ended up grow growing up with. So I was growing up with a sculptor and a painter. And, uh, uh, but he was very um, a kind of oddball, my father as a painter, in terms of his approach to abstraction. Uh, and uh, well, well he, he, he was, in the end, became very kind of aligned, I guess, with Russian constructivism, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as opposed to a kind of de Kooning-esque gestural abstraction. And so gesture and abstraction, gesture and the figure has been always really, I, I can't do it because of him almost. Mm -hmm. It's too, it's, it's almost forbidden, I mean. And, and anyway. uh, We'll get a bit later to your relationship to art history, mm. to the history of art, mm. uh, in, in this case, in a very dramatic way. Uh, but you also have a family history of art, which includes seeing paintings, seeing works of art in Storage. stored. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You and, you and I share that, I right. think, right? Right. So tell us, yeah. uh, share with the, what it's like to see... The sadness and the melancholy. The sadness and melancholy <laughs> of seeing um, works of art in a, in a... Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, me and Mark, we've dealt with the, the death of my father and, and, and my stepfather and just leaving together a lifetime, leaving a lifetime of work mm -hmm. that is there mm -hmm. and dusty and dirty and mm -hmm. broken and who wants it and where to put it and real estate and the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think, I, think I, I, I had success rather late in life. And so at around age 40, the works were piling up in my studio mm -hmm. and my father was dying. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, I need to, to ingest this reality somehow. And I realized that... Um, that it was better to put books on shelves wasn't so shameful mm -hmm. and bad and depressing. Uh -huh. And that it was better to just, maybe, maybe I could organize it like my painting on shelves. Yes. 
and, and then I, and then I would be redeemed and it wouldn't be so bad. <laughs> and one of the motifs is, is, I guess, is then the motif which one sees throughout the works, there's actually one version of it with mm. the, the uh, cross section, as it were, of a plywood. Yeah. Uh, is, is that motif... At the edge. At the edge. Is that motif a kind of um, I did homage? That. <laughs> to, to the work of art in uh, in, in, in its in the shelf in the shelf where it's going uh -huh. yeah a little bit uh -huh. yeah but it's also a, a just a very clear I've done it way before the chapters I've always done it yes I like to do it I like to paint it and it also is a, just a geometry and it suggests the painting as an object instead of a picture yes yeah so um, I guess one one question that the Again, that the Beethoven freeze, I'll let it go in a bit, but the Beethoven okay. freeze raises, raises yeah. Yeah, is no, I um, thought a lot about it. The, the freeze is a ki kind of rite of passage. Yeah. It is a story, and, and Klimt, uh, for better or for worse, gave a very clear program mm -hmm. in which uh, there is this idea of a longing for happiness, mm -hmm. and a hero is born to... Uh, do the quest for happiness. Yeah. He encounters, uh, it's a he. He a encounters lot of women. a lot of women <laughs> in, a, in a kind of Medusa like situation yes. at the far end, which is not unlike what we will go into when we talk about the Von Wien, the, mm -hmm. uh, the Otto von Wien painting. Um, and then he arrives at some kind of Beethoven ideal. And when the viewer goes through the Beethoven freeze, mm. they don't reach necessarily Nirvana. Instead, they reach Beethoven. Right. Uh, and they've gone through this sort of symbolic rite of passage through erotic problems. In short, <laughs> it's a uh, quest romance. Yeah. Or it's painting imagined as a novel, a story. Yeah allegorical, personal, whatever. Yes. Um, you organize your uh, shows as chapters mm -hmm. and therefore in, inevitably a novelistic... It would suggest. Uh, the, uh, or in German, the Roman comes to mind. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea that there is a kind of beginning point and an end point, but you're al always, even in the Beethoven freeze, in the midst of things. Yeah. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about, is there a, a landscape through which we are making our way in this particular chapter? Uh, yeah. If, is there a, any, are there fragments of a story that yeah. you could share I mean, with us? I think, I think, I mean, the whole, all the chapters are a kind of study to figure out how, how what is picture or painting is and whether it can go to... So it's a story about art. It, yeah, painting, mm -hmm. actually. The picture of painting. Because mm -hmm. I do believe uh, pictures are the problem. Uh -huh. The big, big problem for me. And I love all they can do. Um, pictures and painting. So what's, what's the... How do you well, that's a kind of, I think, very, very interesting spot. The difference between a picture and a painting. Um, and one way that abstract painting and Klim showed was that it's architecture and that it's it, it's reflective of our bodies and space and, and in context. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel we're so so sucked into you know da 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 a thousand pictures we've all heard that idea that it's very hard to to feel like there's any we have any agency in the idea of how to even look at a picture. Mm -hmm. Or, or what to expect from a picture, and I do. Un, I, I, I really, I'm very aware of the anxiety around pictures, especially if they're in the form of a painting, about not understanding, not understanding. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you're saying, like, a viewer will come into a museum and not understand it, or not understanding at a, at what level? Well, I mean, I myself have had the not understanding, uh -huh. you know, which is uh -huh. always yes. hard. And I, I once told the story, my father, I was looking at um, uh, Ryman, no, not Ryman, um, Reinhardt, black. At uh, Reinhardt, yeah. And I said, Daddy, I don't like that painting. He said, it doesn't matter if you like it or not, which maybe was a mean thing to say, but it was very big relief to me, uh -huh. actually, <laughs> that it didn't 
matter what I thought. It was just something I could or could not think about. I mean, that it's open. Yes. I do think pictures are open, and that's why they last and can move through time. There are three, just th to stay with that a bit, there are three elements in many of these pictures that are combined as a kind of morphology. On the one, there's, there is this, uh, these uh, patterns, mm. stripes, uh, and then you inter, uh, interpose the stripes the, with the other the checkers. pattern. The checkers. The checkers and the stripes. Yeah. Checkers and stripes. Then there are these figures which have some reference to the painting, and we'll get to the painting uh, in a bit. Um, uh, and, uh, um, and then there's the use of uh, a silky fabric. Yeah. So j first of all, the, the patterns, if, if you, they have a, an effect of making it hard to look at the picture. Yeah, yeah, they have a burn. They have a burn. And I really love painting on them because uh, I feel that those kind of op patterns of, of... So what's a burn for those who don't know? <laughs> uh, you know, an optical burn, it hurts a little bit mm -hmm. and you, you want to move away. Right. Um, but for me, it reminds me of the feeling of looking at a computer screen or light. It's like a burn. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it's a way to kind of counteract that. Um, but also I like the way... Uh, you, they make you move away because you just don't want to look too much for very long at an op pattern. <laughs> but it's also good to paint on it. I don't know why. why. Is it good to paint on I don't know. I don't know. I uh -huh. just love it. I uh -huh. want to do it more. Yes. I, and I discovered that in this chapter, how much I like that. Yes. Because it seems like um, a ground that can compete with what's happening right mm -hmm. now. And it literally just can, can compete. Yes. So in, in, in perspective, uh, getting back to the perspective thing, uh, in perspective, the eye is asked, as it were, to uh, move, uh, to fl fly quickly into the, dis into the infinite distance. The, yeah. the burn that you're uh, describing in, in, as an effect mm -hmm. of these checkers and stripes, especially when they're interposed, also has a deflecting effect, that, but it's quite different, that's right? That's true, yeah. I think so. I mean, every op pattern is a little different. Like you wanna, there's also the, the feeling of wanting to look at the detail mm -hmm. that some of the ops also provide, and especially, so you wanna, you're, you're drawn in to look closely and yet go back far, and then, and then the op, Op can become a kind of gray that go, has a zing, like it has a, z a zzz mm -hmm. to it from a distance that yes. I like. And getting, getting to, uh, to the, um, the painting that you dug up <laughs> yeah. from the Kunstostarsches Museum, yes. um, we're on our way there, but one of, the, uh, one of the features, again, of the Klimt is this Gorgon. Right. There's the ape, the there, ape. Are, um, there are all the women, and one of the features of the uh, figure of the Medusa, yeah. which was, after all, the kind of, uh, one of the main symbols of the secession and of the secessionist artists, one of its features is that it's non-perspectival. Mm -hmm. It uh, is always represented frontal, mm -hmm. and it's simultaneously the... Um, the end, end point of sight because you're kind of mesmerized and it resists sight. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, per, the creation of this perspectival cone mm -hmm. which ends up in the view through the painting yeah. makes me uh, want to ask you a little bit about why it is that in many of your exhibitions and here quite monumentally, mm -hmm. you like to invoke, work with, and, um, uh, and uh, uh, reveal and conceal old master paintings and earlier art. Yeah. I find it as an art historian very fascinating because um, right now the old masters are on the wane in terms of... I think that's so yeah. interesting you think that. But it's definitely, it's a, it's a fact. Student interest, 
Down. Way down. Way <laughs> <laughs> Museums <laughs> desperately trying to really? get curators and contemporary art, um, donors' interest in contemporary art. And it's now the artists who are adopting the old masters. Thank goodness for you. Oh, they are I, so. I, uh, I thought they were so much more popular than the contemporary artists. No, no, no. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> really, I'm but I want to. I, I want to. I want to get then to uh, a, a bit to y the uh, painting uh, that uh, stands both inside and outside the exhibition. Yeah. Uh, how did you find that picture, and um, and what did it do for you, the the uh, Otto von Wien? Um, I guess it was a total accident because my friend Sab Sabine Van Spring, uh is good friends with Gerlinda, and uh, Gerlinda had found these two paintings literally behind the walls, not only in the upper floors, but behind the walls of the session, hidden, and became really interested because she's working with Rubens, both, both, both focus on Rubens. So um, it seemed that... W so she was just discussing it with, I guess, Sabine, and Sabine said, oh, maybe Rebecca would be interested because I, I, I was thinking about doing a show here. I had been invited. And, uh, and then, of course, yes, I saw them. <laughs> of course I'm interested in that, yeah. <laughs> so what, uh, take us through, what, well, what, what exactly, there, you, you could have been shown any image, any image could have, uh, any painting could have come to light, but these paintings came to light. And what was it about these paintings that made them uh, amenable to being interrogated and in some ways well, incorporated. Well, I think, I think for one thing, I've, I just automatically love that period in art. Mm -hmm. I love uh, those paintings that, that, that sort of almost are telling stories and that almost are like language close to the story, where you feel the story is there and you're not quite sure what it is. And mm -hmm. it just, and of course there was just the, the sexual power of the, the female body in those paintings, which was surprising, and why, I guess, they had to be literally hidden and, and repressed. Mm -hmm. And it seemed really interesting to me. I mean, I then became really interested in the Amazons and the whole growing history of that. And then, and then it seemed to also fit into the work, the other chapters I was working on mm -hmm. uh, after I found that. So, so like... Um, it fit into I did I did a small chapter for Vienna in Mumak before, mm -hmm. and and uh, I was thinking about Sissy, believe it or not. Anyway, it's a long story, uh -huh. and ban banderoles mm -hmm. and grammar basically in painting, and then uh, and I'm always interested in the history of engraving, and I'm more and more interested in that, and I've used Ramondi a lot, and so it's contemporaneous to that, uh, and so it was a natural fit for me. Whereas if it had been Rubens, I would have been less interested, ironically. Why, why is that? Because Rubens is so... Um, uh, uh, <laughs> As we can see, Rubens is a controversial artist. Mm -hmm. You either love him or hate him. And, the, and yes. the opinions are pretty strong. And I guess Rubens was... As I was saying, it was like the Catholic Church putting, pulling out all the stops mm -hmm. when they had to battle yes. Luther. And so I'm, was, I, I guess, suppose I'm on the Luther's side. <laughs> <laughs> Kronach. <laughs> I'll stick with Kronach. But these two paintings are pretty far from uh, Lucas Kronach. Well, not so far from Kronach, but, but they yeah. are far from a Lutheran standpoint. No. And, and they, they, they share the... But that anxiety, I think, of the Lutheran is there. So, so, so what do you mean by that? Because uh, I think they're trying desperately to tell history outside of Christianity, uh -huh. too. Uh -huh. And uh, also, suddenly, with prints, there's communication across vast distances. Yes. And the printing press. And then I feel that our time now with the computer is similar to that time of the printing, the Ref Reformation, because of the press and the computer. And, our computer. and both of the pictures... Uh, Particularly the 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 one of um, the Persian women, yeah, uh, not letting their husbands back home until they go out and fight again. Mm -hmm. um, 
it's a story from Plutarch. And yeah. the idea is rather a Freudian indeed. That, yeah, tell uh, that, that. So, right, so, so, uh, so the story is the, um, the Persians are about to be routed by an enemy um, and they're, they're uh, trying to retreat back home. And the women are said to have lifted up their clothing, mm -hmm. exposed themselves, and uh, said, mocking to the men, you tr you're trying to go home, by which they mean both to the city in Persia, but also home as in back to the womb. Right. But you're not going to come home until you go back out, you fools and cowards, yeah. and fight the battle. The Persians go out, fight the battle, and then come home. The, uh, so the, the gesture of showing the genitals mm. is um, what Freud would call unheimlich. <laughs> yeah, it is, explain uh, that a little. It's, it's both, you can't go home, you have to go home, and, it's, and, and the way the artist represents it is um, some kind of uh, terrifying, traumatic Medusa. Medusa-like mm. effect. Yeah. A and um, also that is an interesting uh, feature for perspective. Per, for the perspectival issue, because wherever the painting's going yeah. into the distance, there's another focal point that surprises, shocks, and creates a kind of tear yeah. um, question. <laughs> so these, these, these thoughts that go through the head of, um, of a viewer like myself, mm -hmm. uh, do you, when you go about, for example, mm taking the figures from that painting mm -hmm. and then painting them in some of the uh, paintings. Yeah. Uh, how much of a narrative do you need to feel confident that what you're doing is the right thing to be doing? Do you need a narrative or do you just, do you, do you need a, 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 how much determination is there? That's a good question. There? I yeah. mean, normally when I do an installation, I just do a series of paintings and compose them in the space. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure what the composition is going to be when I arrive with all the paintings. So this is very different in that I, I kind of had to figure it out before I got here um, for a variety of reasons. So I, I didn't have very, a lot of confidence, actually. Mm -hmm. I just was... Tr I, I, it was really a fight between the group and the individual painting much more than usual. Mm -hmm. And so that was interesting to me actually mm -hmm. um, and a sign that I better start focusing maybe on individual paintings and giving them more time and change that which somewhat. you then did which which I did yes. yeah unavoidably because you know you do what you're gonna do it's weird it's like you know you think you could do say I'm gonna do uh -huh. this and then inevitably it completely changes right. with the working through and, and one of the things, just having had the uh, privilege of walking through briefly the exhibition with you, one of the, f one of the results of your engagement with the individual paintings, if we can call them that, mm -hmm. they are, mm -hmm. uh, yes. is that you painted. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about that. That I painted like in a gestural way or, or, right. or, or produced identifiable figures, something I had never done before. Right. So or what was the first, how did that first because come I, about? I, I, I'm always interested in textiles and fabrics, and I went to a large fabric store and made a selection of all different kinds of uh, tool and lace and netting, and then I embedded it in the rabbit skin glue gesso while it was wet, but I would cut out cut out shapes that were in the two Van Veen paintings and in the Ramondi Judgment of Paris mm -hmm. and lay them in and then, and then we sanded them very smoothly. And some, something very uncannily real happened about the figure drawing because of that. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. I really don't know why. But you came to painting and, you, and the, and the uh, show... I, culminates in a painting, yeah? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true, yeah. No, I love, it's just I never felt justified, really, to paint the figure. Yes. I still kind of don't, I mean. Why is that? I don't know, I'm mm -hmm. very, uh, well, one thing, I do believe that it's very hard to invent a mark 
Yes. Like most drawings look the same, you know, of all artists. Um, you can always tell the time a, a drawing was made. Yes. So I feel very uh, suspicious of it somehow. So, so I was going to ask you that before, but I, I actually forgot, and now you brought it back to me, which is the words over the door of the Secession are one of the sort of most famous um, statements about a certain concept of art that every era has its own art, mm -hmm. and therefore, or semicolon, yeah. therefore freedom to art. It's mm -hmm. a freedom to the new, one might understand that, mm -hmm. that, it ha that actually art has to constantly change because time is an arrow, yeah. and at every moment you can't be uh, you can't reach back to a historical style, right. uh, which was, of course, um, the way 19th century painters painted, uh, even though the secession building reaches weirdly back to kind of archaic yeah. past. Yeah. But nonetheless, that idea of um, art always being new, being the new, yeah. and that its freedom is born from its absolute modernity is at odds with some of your procedures, right? Because your art is about a sedimented history. There's, yeah. there's your, the, the paintings that your father has in the storage. Mm. There's the storehouse that keeps the, the Kunsthistorisches Museum's pictures, which were concealed for a, a variety of reasons, whether mm. it's to do with ba uh, bad, um, condition or shocking theme, mm -hmm. but nonetheless, history, you actually excavate history. Yeah. So how do you, how do you understand your work in terms of the imp impulse then to not repeat the past, to, to be new? Uh-huh. Um, or do you think that's no longer a problem? The question of becoming of, of, of always becoming be, is that an new. old issue? Can we? Can Maybe we, that's an old issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can we have a new? Maybe that's an old. I we, think we don't even know what know we're what dealing with right now. Right. In a way, like the press, uh -huh. I don't think we're all uh, unstable about what to do right now uh, with with images and art and how to draw or paint or whatever, photograph or. It, I mean, I don't know, it sounds sort of stupid, but yeah. I, 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 I don't think you can, you can try to be new, for sure. Mm -hmm. But you do know something's new when you, when you when make you, it. Yes. Or, yes, I mean, there's but, no, nothing... But it's always so, so, right. so sort of hard to see. There's nothing like this, <laughs> so it, it actually is the, the new, even though it's a, it's, even it's, it's the old, it's sedimented. the old, it's just a painting, it's just a, a rectangle, it's just a small painting on wood. Yes. So painting is constantly in need of renovation. Well, I think it's a good tool to use to think about the photograph mm -hmm. and the power of the photograph, be it digital or whatever, and the law that, that sucks us into, and it's a good way to Maybe, yeah, I don't know, just have some kind of agency and consciousness of it, mm -hmm. the photograph. Because I feel like every painting now is already a photograph. Yes. It, it, some of your paintings, one of the most beautiful for me, I mean, beauty is something that comes to mind in many of these pictures. And one, mm -hmm. of, the, one of the ones I find very beautiful is this... Uh, uh, is a sort of what seems to be a kind of nocturnal scene uh, over there, a sort of um, uh, with some painting in it. And, and, and it brought forward the importance for you of landscape. Yeah. Uh, I, and you, you said to me um, cryptically <laughs> <laughs> that, you're, that thought, you're a landscape painter in a way. I, I would, Could yeah, you? I'm always like, what kind of painter am I? Because uh -huh. people say, what kind of painter are you? A landscape painter. I could say I'm a landscape painter. So in what sense are you a landscape painter? This is a landscape. Uh -huh. People, just my time is the landscape, and the installation is the landscape. And I'm interested very much, you know who I really love, what painter I really love? Who? Roysdale. Ah. 
and I love the size of a figure in a Roysdale painting. I find it very moving. Yes. The yes. way um, the figure's tiny, and the, I feel like it's right somehow. Yes. It, it's accurate. Yes. I was reminded with that one picture, because uh, you paint a few painted features within this yeah. um, darkness, and yeah. it reminded me of the very dramatic event in the work of Turner, the uh, English artist. Oh, yeah, artist. this story, I didn't ever heard this story. You should tell this story. Stri so yeah, so Turner was, when he um, made his landscapes, especially towards the end, he would come to the last day when you could exhibit your work, and he would sort of push his way in, and there was a huge audience, and he would finish the painting, which meant he would take fundamentally an abstraction yeah. and turn it into a landscape yeah. uh, by just a few. You didn't know whether it was going to be a seascape or um, a, a Roman history or Dido or yeah. Carthage destroying yeah. or whatever. You, you finished it on the day. So there was a, a performative aspect. When, you, uh, when you're working, is the, uh, how do you actually um, uh, do your perf the performance of your art? Is it a very solitary task, or do you have people around you? I have you? some people around, and then I did build the wall in my studio, which is much smaller, so that all the paintings were piled on top of each other, but I painted the paintings in the corner, in the corner. corner. Um, and... Uh, I listen to a lot of books while I paint. Uh -huh. I don't know. I, the uh -huh. gesso, I have an assistant to help me do gesso and silk screening. But, but I began to figure out a way to just paint, like the old kind of fashion way where you paint. Yes. <laughs> In a way. I did do that in this chapter. I'm being given a sign. Yeah. I would like oh, to thank you, you so much. Thank you. Yeah. For Thank you conversing. very much. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Oh, I can't drink this. Come on.